This is Jose Merino, Editor-in-Chief of the Neurology Family of Journals. The Neurology Podcast provides practical information to neurologists and other clinicians to help them provide better care for their patients. Thanks for listening and have a great week. Hello, this is Hallie Alexander from Wake Forest University. I'm here today with Jackie French and Nora Jandiala from New York University, and we're discussing their recent paper titled Unrecognized Focal Non-Motor Seizures in Adolescents Presenting to Emergency Departments. This was a retrospective analysis of data from the Human Epilepsy Project, and as the title suggests, they looked at recognition of motor versus non-motor seizures in the ED and its effect on management of focal epilepsy in adolescents. So welcome, Jackie and Nora. I'm so honored to have you on the podcast. We're really excited to be here. Thank you so much for inviting us. Yes, thank you for having us. So let's jump right in. I want to know what surprised you most about your results? The most surprising thing was definitely that no adolescent patients had a history of non-motor seizures identified. So many adolescent patients presented with a first lifetime motor seizure, but actually had a history of non-motor seizures. And the fact that None of this history was picked up really was surprising to us, especially given that these were really significant experiences that they were having, and sometimes for multiple years. One example that comes to mind from our cohort was a patient who had heard voices say repeated phrases loudly in his mind for two years. And it was very surprising to us that this history wasn't picked up, given that it was so significant. And also, it is not uncommon when people have these small, what we call focal aware seizures, which are seizures as they sound that start in one like little area of the brain, and you don't lose awareness when they are occurring. And they obviously take the pattern of whatever part of the brain they start in. The good example with the, with the auditory hallucination they occur maybe intermittently for several years, but then when they convert to a motor seizure, it is not uncommon that they happen on that particular day repeatedly and more intensely leading up to what is usually a tonic-clonic seizure. So um, to ask what happened prior to the tonic-clonic seizure seems like it would be something that everybody would ask. And that's why it's really surprising that nobody asked, not one ER physician asked. Right. Yeah, that's so surprising and significant for the management and treatment. Do you want to talk about how that affected diagnosis and treatment? So in the epilepsy world, you need to have one of two things in order to be diagnosed with epilepsy. Either you have to have two events because epilepsy, the definition is an enduring predisposition to have seizures. And sometimes it's hard to say you have an enduring predisposition after a single event, or you have to have some other factors such as a remote cause of epilepsy, which was actually pretty uncommon in these adolescents or or non-existent, such that you know that the likelihood of another seizure is more than 60%. So uh, with a first lifetime, what appeared to be a first lifetime tonic-clonic seizure, the usual path is watchful waiting, not treatment and not necessarily referral for additional care to a neurologist. And I've even heard several of the people, since I was an enrolling physician in this study, when people described to me that first event They often use the term, and I just laugh every time I say it, everybody gets one seizure for free. You've heard that phrase as well. So everybody gets one seizure for free. I don't know. I I wouldn't pay for a seizure, but... uh, you know, that usually means that we're not going to do anything. And it is a missed opportunity, an absolute missed op- opportunity, because epilepsy could be diagnosed there and then. Yeah. And a lot of these adolescents went through a pathway where they went to the ED after having had seizures for a significant period of time. They weren't picked up. They went home after this first lifetime seizure and then had another tonic-clonic event 
had head injuries, saw additional physicians, and then had to represent to the ED. So they went through additional stressful and potentially harmful experiences that could have been avoided had it been picked up at that initial visit. And I think that was really impactful for us. Yeah, so this is such an important thing that your study has uncovered. I also thought it was surprising that even assuming it was a first-time motor seizure, a lot of the patients were not always referred to a neurologist. Do you think it's because of that idea you mentioned, Jackie, of that like, oh, everyone gets a free first-time seizure? Yeah, I do. If they thought there was a focal onset to the seizure, if they had recognized that, then they might have said, oh, this may be related to a lesion in the brain. It may be related to something else. But when it appears to be a healthy adolescent with a single tonic-clonic seizure, that somehow triggers a different pathway. It would be really interesting to interview a number of ER physicians. Obviously, they're not neurologists. They didn't call a neurologist. So it's just the ER physician and see if they have rote pathways that they follow in scenario A or scenario B. A main takeaway, like you're mentioning then, is that the ER is a a major touch point for these patients who are coming in thinking it's first time seizure. So improving that evaluation is really key by these ER physicians. But getting the ER to maybe change their protocol or to ask the right question sounds like it could be easier said than done. So what sort of things do you suggest to help improve that? One of the things that we've thought about a lot is kind of the line of questioning for when you're taking a history for a patient who comes in with a first lifetime motor seizure. Typically, at least in the pediatric ED, from what I've seen, they ask about things like tongue biting, urinary incontinence, uh, but maybe not necessarily non-motor symptoms. So in this work, we proposed two simple questions that could be asked. One of them gets at what Dr. French had mentioned earlier, which is an aura at the beginning of a seizure. So the first question is, did you feel anything at the beginning of the seizure? And if so, have you ever felt the same thing before? So that might allow us to realize that this experience is not happening for the first time, but may point to a focal event that has been going on. And the second thing, is before today, did you have any feelings, such as feeling scared, anxious, worried, a sudden thought out of nowhere, deja vu, that came on suddenly for no reason and lasted less than five minutes? So these are two questions that we proposed in this study to capture features that are really concerning for a seizure. Dr. French has come up with a mnemonic for this, which is SSSS, sudden, short, strange, and similar, that could be helpful to really narrow down what symptoms are actually concerning when a patient has a a strange event like this. I love that. I'm just going to repeat it because I think it's great and helpful, I think, for the adolescent population, too, to really explain it to them. So SSSS, short, sudden, strange, and similar. It's so fascinating because when you ask patients this question in the exam room, if they haven't had them, they look at you like you have two heads. And if they have had them, they look at you and their pupils literally dilate in front of you. Like, how did you read my mind? How do you know what's going on with me? Because they've been holding on to this for so long and they don't know how to process it or interpret it. And suddenly somebody has given voice to it. And sometimes they really are, as Nora said, very strange experiences. I had one patient who saw herself as a child in a past life. That was what she experienced. I had another individual who described it as if he was hearing all the music in the universe at once. How do you as an adolescent process that going on? How do you even start the conversation? Yeah, and and they certainly wouldn't bring it up of their own volition, thinking maybe you are going to think they were, you know, crazy or, you know, there's stigma around that. But if you're framing it as seizures can show up multiple ways, have you ever had this, this, and this? I think that really helps them say, oh, it could be a seizure. Let me share that with you. And now your study, of course, was focusing on focal seizures. But sometimes I would think when they come to the ER, the onset might not be clear, or maybe the onset is not their highest concern in the ER. Because I've also seen a lot in generalized epilepsy patients who get that diagnosis 
only after the first convulsion and then only in retrospect do they recognize the steering episodes or maybe even the myoclonic jerks that were seizures. So potentially those are things to ask about as well. I know that's happened for a lot of patients when I ask about myoclonus, that recognition, like you were mentioning, and they think, oh, that's a seizure. I thought just everybody had that. They just never knew that that was something that was relevant. I recently heard a story from one of my adult patients remembering back to her diagnosis with JME, and that's obviously juvenile myoclonic epilepsy. That's where it usually happens. And she was 13 and she started to have myoclonic jerks that were so intense in the morning that she had trouble getting out of bed. And her mother interpreted that as she didn't want to go to school and thought that it was a psychiatric or, you know, a behavioral issue. And she actually made her own diagnosis in the end because nobody was paying attention to her. She went to the internet and she eventually went to her mother and said, I think I have JME. And the mother still didn't believe her until she had a tonic-clonic seizure. And then I'm sure the mother is now paying for it for the rest of her life. But that first tonic-clonic seizure, both in generalized and in focal epilepsy, unfortunately, in, in our population as a whole, adolescent and adult, in the Human Epilepsy Project, 70% of people were only diagnosed when they had a tonic-clonic seizure. The word has to get out. You don't have to shake to be having a seizure. And I think that in 95% of the minds of people in America, seizure equals shake. Yeah, I think you're right. There's a lot of education that needs to be done there. Now, your study specifically focused on the adolescent population, you know, ages 12 to 18, but you did look at adults as well. So did you find similar missed recognition in the adult population? We did. Interestingly enough, the number that were picked up in the emergency room in terms of their prior seizures was somewhat higher for adults. It wasn't zero. So it really kind of surprised us that in adolescence, the question was asked even less. It wasn't asked often in adults, but at least it was asked sometimes. But in adolescence, it was never asked. So that was sort of an interesting thing to us. But, you know, in adults, you have other consequences as well. Of course, you know, some adolescents are already driving. But in our population as a whole, we actually published an article in Neurology talking about driving. And 5% of our cohort had a car accident before their diagnosis because they were not diagnosed quickly enough. And interestingly enough, some even had more than one car accident before the diagnosis because they were having focal impaired aware seizures where they were having some altered awareness as well. And one woman had three car accidents before her diagnosis. Wow, she's lucky to still be around. Well, the problem is we can't enroll people if they didn't make it, right? So we have no idea what the consequences are in regards to that. We only know the people who made it into our study. That's true, yeah. So some of these misdiagnoses may have ended very unfortunately, I and mean, you don't even have that data. I mean, tonic-clonic seizures also as we know, are a cause of sudden unexplained death in epilepsy. And there are many recorded cases where it happened in the first or second tonic-clonic seizure of somebody's life. So one doesn't want to wait around for the tonic-clonic seizure to happen with all the consequences. Right, which is why this study is so important. I actually heard a story recently of a child who presented with a seizure and while he was waiting for the EEG and MRI to, you know, determine the diagnosis, he had a second seizure and ended up dying. So, it was, you know, these things happen. So just, I mean, this, why this study is so important and I'm hoping we can really bring more awareness to this. But unfortunately, we probably don't have many ER providers listening to our podcast. Hope maybe we do. So can you tell us a little bit, what can we do as neurology providers to help improve this? I mean, you mentioned some of those questions, which are great, but have you undertaken any actionable protocol changes at your institutions to try to really improve the ER workflow? I think that's going to be the next step. 
And, you know, the barrier there is that the emergency room physician has so many conditions to deal with. So if you try and give them specific educational information about epilepsy, they may not be very, very open to it. We did actually publish a paper in an emergency room journal on the adult side. So that was our sort of hope that maybe somebody would be out there listening. We have not heard any responses from it. So (laughs) I think that uh, the, the team very strongly believes that an ER intervention would be an important next step. And we are regrouping to decide what would actually be listened to. And that is really the critical thing. Right. Yeah. Because they're so pressed for time in the ER. And so you really have to have the buy-in from that department as well. But I look forward to hearing what you come up with. And hopefully that can be adopted at other institutions as well. Yeah. I think teaching about SSSS because it's so short and simple is something that can be effective. One strategy might be through education, especially educating those who are going to be entering the field of emergency medicine through talking to residents and medical students. So myself as a medical student, I've tried to bring it into discussions of epilepsy and of emergency department care with other students. And I found that it's something that they had never thought of before. So I think that's a potential avenue as well to raise awareness. I love that. That's such a great idea. Well, thanks again to both of you for joining us today. Our pleasure. Thank you for having us. And be sure to check out the article in the May 28th issue of Neurology titled Unrecognized Focal Non-Motor Seizures in Adolescents Presenting to Emergency Departments. This is Stacey Clardy, your podcast editor. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please take a few moments to subscribe, rate, and review the Neurology Podcast through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. And remember, you can always head to neurology.org backslash podcast for our full list of past episodes, where you can also search by keyword in your podcast app for any neurology-specific topics you want to learn about.